Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Justin Gatewood. Um, Justin graduated from the University of Washington School of Medicine uh, some number of years ago. I won't, I won't say how many, I guess. <laughs> um, so he's, and he's got family around the region, so he's plenty familiar with the beautiful weather we have this time of year. Exactly. Uh, Justin uh, did his residency at the Univers University of Chicago Hospitals, where he was also education chief resident. Um, and is now an attending physician at the emergency department um, at Washington Hospital Center out in D.C. Um, I met Justin about a year ago um, when I was out visiting the Microsoft Me Medical Media Lab out there. Um, in fact, Liz is, is out here from there. Um, and since then, we've been collaborating on several projects, mostly to do with patient-facing uh, patient information displays. Um, it's been a blast working with Justin, I must say. Um, both because of his uh, breadth and depth of expertise and interests um, in the medical domain, but also in, in technology, uh, which is sort of a, a difficult combination to come by. Um, Justin's here uh, for the day. I've got a couple of open slots later in the day, if anyone would like a slot. Um, um, catch me after this, this meeting. Um, and, you know, hopefully these exchanges start to foster more collaboration, both with Justin, um, but also with Washington Hospital Center and the MedStar unit as a whole, um, you know, as well as the various health solutions group labs out there. Um, without further ado, I'm going to hand the mic over to Justin. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Desney. Um, and, you know, just to kind of get sentimental uh, a little bit here, Microsoft has been great. Um, Washington Hospital Center and Microsoft have kind of an established um, relationship. I think starting back from the development of a Zixi, which clearly we know now is a amalgam by uh, Dr. Craig Fyatt and Dr. Mark Smith. Um, and so that's just sort of continued to roll and, and things have been great and we're kind of uh, forging ahead and um, asking some interesting questions. So thanks for having me here, I, I appreciate it. Um, so again, Justin Gatewood, um, and I'm an attending physician um, in emergency medicine. And this is sort of your chance to pick the brain of an ER doc to get under the hood of an, a working emergency department. And I want to kind of take a, a systems view of the emergency department. Um, it can be sort of a apparently chaotic place uh, on the outside, but it actually makes sense. There's a method to the madness, and I want to kind of elucidate some of that. So the objectives for today, and we've got the room until 12, I want to spend roughly half of that um, kind of talking. I don't want it to be too didactic, and then I want the other half to just be a lot of sort of question and answer discussion, brainstorming of potential collaborations. Um, please feel free uh, to stop me at any time to ask questions. Um, a couple disclaimers here before we start. Um, I don't have any formal training in, in um, systems theory or in computer science or in mathematics. Sometimes I may uh, flirt with terms, that you, and you feel free to say, hey, that's not, you know, we're purists here, that's not the, the correct usage of the term. Um, another disclaimer, I'm a physician, I have a very physician-centric view of workflow, um, so that bias is inherent as well. Um, with any uh, talk about workflow, there's going to be lots of flow diagrams. Um, I, th this is not up to UML convention, I didn't use Visio, I should have. Um, but that being said, um, Hopefully you'll be able to, to grasp some of the concepts. They're quite, they're quite um, straightforward. So we'll deconstruct the flow um, in the emergency department looking at two, uh, two systems. One, the flow of patients and al also the flow of information. Um, Sometimes they can be one and the same um, in a very high volume active emergency department. Um, and then I want to examine some of the concepts that underlie medical decision making because I, I hope that our discussion can move past just examining workflow but also um, get towards um, really understanding um, how a physician's mind works um, and how decisions are made. Um, and then I want to just take a second to highlight some existing MSR and uh, Washington Hospital Center collaborations um, and then get into areas that we can work together. So a bit about my hospital. I, um, uh, MedStar Health is 
um, a large uh, health organization. We have several hospitals in the Washington, Baltimore area, um, of which Georgetown is also one. Um, Washington Hospital Center is the largest. It's the largest in the District of Columbia. It's got 926 beds. It's a, it's a very large hospital. It's also a major teaching hospital. Uh, we accept patients from all over the area, so it's a tertiary care referral center. Um, it's also the level one trauma center and the only burn center in the area. Um, and a plug for the hospital, consistently ranked by U.S. News and World Report um, in several areas. About the department itself, we provide um, care, uh, emergency medicine and trauma care for adult patients. Um, there's a children's hospital directly across the parking lot, so, so we, don't see, we don't see kids. Sometimes they'll wander in. We see about 85,000 patients a year. Um, that breaks into, you know, as much as 300 patients a day on a very busy day. Um, we have a very uh, a population that reflects the District of Columbia. Um, it's largely African American, although we have a surprisingly diverse um, international population. There are several universities nearby. Um, uh, more than a third of the, um, the patients that we serve are illiterate, and from that I'll deduce um, um, have health illiteracy as well. The 37 percent is something that was put out by D.C. government to describe actually all of, all of um, D.C., functionally illiterate, all of, all of D.C. And as far as payers go, the majority have public assistance Medicaid. Um, as far as a, a degree of the acuity of patients, um, we see, we roughly admit to the hospital, and this is, a, this is sort of a proxy for how sick our patients are, we roughly admit about a quarter of our patients. 10 to 15 percent of those admissions, or about 2 to 3 percent of the entire people that we serve, um, end up in the, in the critical care unit. So just to kind of give you a, um, a benchmark, this, this is a, we, we see really, really sick folks. The department itself is, uh, and I'll go into the layout, it's 42 beds. Um, at any time there can be up to six attending level emergency physicians. An attending physician is just a physician who has finished um, their residency training. Um, anywhere from 10 to 20 emergency trained nurses. Um, we also are a emergency medicine residency training site. Um, and we have scads of uh, great Georgetown medical students as well. So first I just want to talk about the, the principles of information flow. As you sort of, if we go through um, the, f the flow of patients and information, you'll, you'll see a couple things emerge here. First of all, in really the classic sense of the, of the term, um, they're both the ter a deterministic and a non-deterministic system. Um, you know, some things are measured output for every input, and other things um, you put a patient in the system and you really don't know what you're going to get. Um, and this is really important to, to realize. You put in um, a therapy, you administer a medication, um, and you really don't know what you're going to get. And that's something inherent in, in uh, emergency medicine and in medicine itself. Um, um, another concept, there's asynchronous flow, uh, but you have these parallel sort of pathways. Patients go in the system um, at different times. They converge at different nodes, um, whether it be in a radiology suite, lab. So they're all different bottlenecks and they all sort of manage their way out of the system, and we'll go through that as well. Uh, another thing is, um, this is not just a linear um, pathway. You will see that um, patients will come back to different nodes. Uh, we are constantly reevaluating the patient. Um, the machine sort of will go, start and stop, and we'll do different iterations of, of therapy. Um, so it, it's not just, um, we're not going just straight through here. Uh, and another thing is it can be very chaotic. And I mean this in, you know, the lay sense of the word. Um, you walk in and it can be very chaotic. In sort of more of this, the system sense of the word, it's chaotic in that there are identifiable patterns within what appears to be chaos. Um, and hopefully you can uh, make some connections there as well as we go through. Um, how many people have ever been to the emergency department? I think most folks have been to the emergency department. And how many of those people, how many kind of understood what was going on? Okay, great. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And uh, 
kudos to that emergency department that they were able to, to have it make sense. I wish we were always able to do that. A lot of people, I think, see the emergency department as a, as a black box. I mean, patient in, patient out. Um, the same could be said for a hospital as well. Um, and I'll use the, the words of uh, my mentor, Mark Smith, and, and also Dr. Craig Fayad, um, who wrote a manuscript back in 99 um, looking at um, the emergency department as a complex system. In a sense, it really looks much like a hospital. Um, people go in, they're evaluated, they're treated, tests are run, decisions are made, hopefully uh, cures um, occur, and then the patient comes out on the other side. Um, so the emergency department is kind of a small, temporally compressed version of that. Um, in fact, though, the emergency department looks much more like this, and we'll fill in each of these boxes. Um, so if you can kind of keep this framework at the front of your mind as we're walking through flow, um, I think it'll be um, um, kind of easy to understand where things fall into place. So, you know, the first kind of space um, in, in flow is a pre-hospital space. It's not even in the department itself. Um, second is when people come, they register and they're triaged. We'll, of course, walk through this. Evaluation and management is by far the most complicated, um, in a sense, the most chaotic, uh, and it's a place where we'll be able to explore some of the decision making. And then lastly, the disposition, that is, where does the patient go once we're done with them? Um, the diagram itself looks like this, and we'll walk through each part, so keep that in mind. Um, starting from the beginning, so the pre-hospital setting is anywhere that the patient comes from. So patients arrive by um, ambulance, they arrive by helicopters, we run um, MedStar Transport, we have several helicopters and ground units that um, fly and pick uh, patients up, they go to scenes, get people off of the freeway, they get them from other hospitals. Um, so they arrive by ambulance, helicopter, uh, DC Fire Department brings them, sometimes they're transferred via private ambulance. All those people are funneled in. Um, clearly they walk in um, as well and are dropped off by friends and at times we will get people from the hospital. These are patients who are in the cafeteria, um, visiting a family, um, uh, and who become acutely ill and are brought to the emergency department. So once a patient is, enters into the physical space of the emergency department, the first thing that happens is that they're registered. We have to be able to generate a chart for them, um, a computer chart or an electronic chart, and we generate a medical record number and a visit number. Um, and that happens when a patient presents to a front desk and, and states their chief complaint. The chief complaint, um, I wish it would be something like, well, I have chest pain of cardiac etiology. Um, but often it's, I don't feel well. Um, so, and we'll see how that can be kind of um, confusing in terms of codifying why people are actually in the emergency department. Um, their demographics, um, how they're going to pay, of course, we, we have to get paid. And then that's when the paper chart is generated. Um, I won't get into all the, diff the disparate electronic medical records, um, but in our department currently we have paper charts that are filled out um, and then scanned into an electronic medical record. Um, so after the chart is generated, then uh, they'll, be, they'll be triaged. So triage, if anybody speaks French, is French to sort. Um, and what triage does is when a person enters, um, it's a way of determining essentially how sick you are. You'll hear in emergency medicine this idea of sick or not sick. A lot of what we do as a specialty is determining, um, certainly we want to find a diagnosis, but we want to know are you sick, i.e., are you likely to die in X amount of time, or are you not? Um, and by assigning a triage priority, that's a way initially of sort of deciding how quickly a person should be seen and what resources that they're likely to, to need. This is done by a nurse, um, and it's based on symptoms, age, um, vital signs that are taken initially. That's just heart rate, blood pressure, temperature, oxygen level. Um, and get, just getting a quick past medical history. There are two ways of doing this. There is an a, a ESI algorithm. Um, I couldn't even tell you what it stands for. Um, but this is an algorithm that basically you can go through that will then assign you a triage number. I will tell you 
uh, seasoned nurses can look at a person and say, mm, you look like you're about a two, you look like you're a, f a four. Um, one is the most acute, um, and then four are, you know, sprained ankles, uh, you know, hangnails, that sort of thing. Okay, um, and then patients are sequentially assigned to the treatment teams. We have um, four treatment teams. We have the blue team, the red team, the green team. Uh, the color has no significance at all. They're just geographic areas. And then we have the ambulatory care area, which is like an urgent care fast track. Um, most, if not all, larger emergency departments have these areas. Um, from there, um, patients will often go through a triage team. This provides a lot of confusion for uh, patients and for people who aren't um, familiar with the flow of uh, the department. And I'll try to make this as clear as possible. The triage team is sort of an optional team that's in place through which all patients are funneled on the way to the teams to which they are actually assigned. Um, the purpose of the triage team is to do just sort of a rapid evaluation to sort of get the ball rolling and to anticipate any diagnostic procedures, any, any diagnostic um, tests that the um, team physician on the other end would likely, would likely order. A quick example would be uh, someone who comes in and has chest pain. Instead of, after their triage, instead of putting the patient in the waiting room, you can say, well, Dr. Gatewood's going to see you on the green team. The wait may be a while, but it, in the time being, we'll go ahead and draw some blood and, and send you the chest x-ray so that by the time all of these things are back, Dr. Gatewood will be able to make a more informed decision. Um, the triage team at our hospital, um, emergency department, is only operates between 10 a.m. and midnight. Um, so actually the majority of the you know, around the clock, we do not have um, the triage team, but we do during the busiest um, uh, times. And we've actually seen that that does sort of increase throughput, um, depending on how you measure it. So patients wait in the waiting area until they're seen by the respective team after they see the triage doctor, okay? So you go, triage doctor says hi, and then you still sit out in the waiting room. It can be several hours on a busy day until you're actually able to see um, the physician to which you're assigned. Um, medical decision making is incredibly complex. It takes a period of observation. It, it takes some thought. Um, and it takes uh, getting a very full history of the illness and doing a, a good physical exam and a period of observation. So the evaluation by this doctor in triage is not a substitute for a full examination um, on the other respective teams. That's something that, that patients often have a hard time with. They say, well, a doctor already saw me, why can't I go home? Um, and it's sometimes difficult to explain um, that it's not always that simple. So after they've waited, um, patients are placed in rooms on the respective geographic teams as they become available. Um, they're first placed in order of acuity and then duration of wait. Um, this causes a degree of duress because Patients don't necessarily understand that, um, well, this guy is, an, it's a, if I have an 85-year-old with chest pain who's had uh, medical heart history stents placed and, and has a history of a heart attack, I understand that you've been here for five hours with a sprained ankle and that this patient just came in. She's much more acute. She has a higher uh, triage um, number or a lower number, higher acuity, so she needs to come back, come back first. Uh, and then after acuity, of course, it's then placed by duration of wait. Um, as I mentioned, the team colors have no relation to acuity. And the least acute patients during the hours, at least at our hospital, of uh, 10 a.m. and midnight um, go to the ambulatory care area, okay? And so they're just sort of fast-tracked through. Um, so during the evaluation, this is where the patient-physician relationship really begins. Um, this is when the doctor takes a full medical history, performs a physical exam, um, and begins the workup or thinking about the diagnostic uh, therapy. The, the diagnostics and the therapy, that's when they're initiated. Um, 
And this is really when medical decision making begins. Um, some of it can begin back uh, it, around where the triage doctor is, um, but all that is is to anticipate the medical decision making that will take place here. Um, any questions thus far? I think that's kind of a good place to. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you might get to this, but um, is it your so you're describing how it kind of works at, in, at the abstract? Uh, at least in some places, it. Um, there, it actually doesn't always work that way in the sense that the nurse, that people may be assigned an emergency severity index number. It's not actually, it doesn't actually correspond to the one that's in the book. Because, Absolutely. Right. Okay. Absolutely. So, and this is part of the, that's part of the chaos that, 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 can, that, that can happen. As you mentioned, the SI algorithm is not 100%. Clinical gestalt by even the most season of nurse is not. Uh, patients will often declare their true acuity, and remember acuity can change because the natural course of disease can change, um, um, and so bad outcomes can happen in the waiting room as someone who comes in with chest pain um, then begins to have abnormal vital signs and may declare themselves as being more acute. So the idea is that we can get people back to see doctors as soon as possible so that someone doesn't start off a four and then a three and then a two, all this happening in the waiting room. Um, and that's why we've sort of put the triage team out front to be able to kind of capture um, some of that. But that's a, that's a very good point. This is best case scenario, how it's happened. And I'll actually go through a couple, um, uh, a couple scenarios as well. Um, so, after the, we'll talk just briefly about physician documentation, how it happens um, at our hospital, in our department. Um, physician documentation happens around the uh, patient-physician um, in encounter. Um, so after taking a, a good uh, history and a physical exam, um, the physician will either handwrite the note at the bedside, will go out depending on individual sort of you know, micro workflow, write it outside of the room. Um, sometimes they'll busy, they'll just keep it all in their brain. They'll go do other tasks. An hour later, they'll come back and handwrite the note or type the note. Currently, notes are not being typed bedside. Um, workflow in the environment just doesn't facilitate that. Handwritten notes and also the type notes are sometimes scanned and then into the electronic medical record. Uh, now we have Paladin, which is sort of a module onto Amalga, which will allow you to electronically sign. Um, and so we've got different physicians prefer to uh, handle documentation differently. Um, in our and that's only in our department. So after the evaluation, this is when the workup begins. And a workup basically is just, you know, the diagnostic tests. Um, so patients and their, their appropriate specimens flow to the appropriate laboratory um, or imaging suite. So what happens is a physician comes out and says, this person could have this, I want to order this. They go, they write down the order, they give it to a clerk, the clerk inputs it into the system, and then the sort of ancillary diagnostic suites are activated. So. Um, the CAT scan will say, uh, we see an order here for a uh, CAT scan of the brain. Um, then we will, when time allows, send patient transport out to get that patient. Um, the patient will go over, get the CAT scan, and then go back. Um, urine is sent, blood is sent, spinal fluids, etc., are sent to the labs. Um, what happens is the clerk, and this is getting pretty granular, but the clerk will print out a sticker to go on the tube with the patient's name, the type of test ordered, that will be sent down um, to the lab. Um, so uh, the physician orders the test um, and takes this, then the nurse takes a specimen, which is sent either to the hospital laboratory or also the emergency department itself has its own laboratory that does sort of qu quick, um, you know, time critical tests, sort of ultra time critical. Everything's time critical in the emergency department. Um, those results, if they are critical, um, will often be called directly to the physician. 
um, for really high values or really low values depending on the test. Um, once those tests are run, they'll also put into the local um, database um, that's sort of specific to uh, the, the lab. And then the electronic medical record, Amalga, is able to um, locate those from disparate databases and then pull them into one field um, which the physician can view. And then the physician views the electronic medical record. Um, radiology happens similarly. The physician orders the test, um, either performs, uh, sometimes themselves will perform some bedside imaging techniques in the case of ultrasound. More often, they will go to the respective imaging suite. Um, that information is then put into a local database, um, which is then viewed by the radiologist. So emergency physicians um, are credentialed to read certain types of imaging studies, but uh, we can't read them all. The radiologist will then um, call back the results to us um, or dictate them um, and have a written report in the electronic medical record. Um, often in the case of a simple x-ray, the emergency physician will just look at the image in Amalga and then make a decision. Yeah. Quality of the in and out of department tests roughly assumed to be roughly the same, or is there also a discrepancy? Are you trading time off for quality? No. Um, there are certain sta uh, standards that are established by the Department of Laboratory Medicine, and so um, although the tests are run in different ways, you are you can hang your medical decision making hat on the test that you get. Um, it's, we would love to do everything in department, but sheer volume prevents us from doing that. Um, so ther therapy, once, uh, once you've decided a workup, you uh, um, start to administer therapy, the appropriate IVs, medication, oxygen, um, sometimes procedures are performed, um, and then often consultants or, or specialists are involved, depending on the case. Now, all of this happens um, at sometimes simultaneously, some processes are dependent on other things. Um, in, in terms of therapy, often you are administering therapy and then you're going back to reevaluate the response to your therapy based on that decision. Sometimes you'll order another x ray, another CAT scan, order more blood or urine tests. So these things are interdependent. Often they're also happening in parallel. Um, and there are multiple feedback loops happening. Um, this is for one patient. So, you know, superimpose this same flow, um, you know, as, a, as a, an attending emergency physician, it's not uncommon that on a very busy Monday afternoon, I will have 25 people at a time assigned to my team. So imagine that big nasty diagram, 25 folks deep, um, and, you know, you've only got one lab, you've only got one, you know, two or three CAT scan machines, you've only got one orthopedic uh, surgeon in-house available for consults. So things can get, that's really where the, the, the bottlenecks occur. Um, and then lastly, we'll talk about disposition. Um, when we decide on a disposition, Clearly, certain medical conditions and responses to therapy dictate where the patient goes. If they're being discharged, it implies usually that they're going home. Sometimes they're being transferred to another institution. Um, often they will leave against medical advice, um, which is unfortunate, but sometimes uh, what we deem as being sort of a priority does not always, I mean, if you've got five dogs at home and no one's gonna feed the dogs, then maybe you just don't want to stay to get that other test. And so um, sometimes, you know, that's important for the patient. Others will just sort of disappear and leave a wall. And then, unfortunately, some patients do die as well. Um, if the patient is not discharged, they're then admitted. So we admit patients based on how ill they are, based on the need for extra more tests, more interventions, things that cannot be accomplished while they're in the emergency department. And there are several areas in the emergency department to which they're admitted. 
Uh, and that really depends on how ill they are and, and what resources they need. Um, so when someone's just admitted to the floor, uh, this is just sort of a general medical or surgical bed. These patients are sick enough to stay in the hospital, but you know, they don't, um, they're not critically ill. Um, critically ill patients stay in the ICU. We have uh, different ICUs depending on specialty. Sometimes patients meet criteria to be in the intermediate care, which is sort of in between, and I won't get into that because it just delves into a lot of medicine. Um, and then some folks go to the operating room. Um, so here again is that big nasty uh, um, flow chart. And one thing I want to point out is uh, you'll hear there are several metrics that we track and are easy to calculate. Um, the door to doctor time is probably the one that you'll hear most and that's basically how long it takes you to see um, a doctor. Uh, um, door to decision time is the time that they enter the door tell the time that a, the, a decision to either discharge them or admit them is made. Um, after they're admitted, they may reside in the emergency department proper for some amount of time. That's the boarding time and it's completely, it is most dependent upon what else is happening in the hospital. Um, and then of course the length of stay is from the time they enter the door to the time they physically leave the department. Um, so we talked a, a little bit about, you know, kind of individual flow of patients. Um, and I wanted to talk about sort of stepping back and viewing the department and all the chaos. Um, and here's sort of a face-based diagram of, um, of the, de the emergency department um, kind of the state of emergency department. And you could probably, there are probably several different types of states, um, but the one that I wanted to talk about is sort of the progression from normal operations to disaster. Um, it's great, you get there at seven o'clock in the morning, you've, uh, there may be some intoxicated folks sleeping it off from last night, someone slips on the ice in the morning, the department's slow, um, folks are not that acute, you're down here, hey, great, normal ops, we're getting people through. Um, and on this axis here is the number of patients. This is basically just a measure of acuity. Um, and so when there's a time when you have a lot of patients um, and really none of them are that acute, but there are still so many, that can be classified uh, really down kind of in the disaster zone. In fact, when you talk about um, emergency preparedness and disaster medicine, the majority of people who present, even after a major bus crash or a dirty bomb detonation, are people who are um, not very acute. It's usually the walking wounded. People who are just freaked out and they just want to get checked. People who have, have you know, rolled their ankle and are very sick. Um, but occasionally, let's say an example where um, like we all heard, unfortunately, in, in, in Lakewood um, yesterday where those, uh, the four police um, were shot, uh, it, was, it was early in the morning. They may have been taken to a local emergency department where there were a few patients, but four shooting victims are all very acute, um, could be classified as uh, a disaster. Um, so it sort of depends. The funny thing is, and just sort of think about this, is at some point, we say this is a disaster and we flip a switch, we make a call to the head of the, the hospital and we go into disaster mode. Um, and when we do that, we open these pelican boxes, we put on, we put on these, uh, um, these vests, we have walkie talkies and we sort of get into disaster mode and we follow, um, you know, sort of a different flow of patient care and, and we change some of our resources and we change the way that we look at patients a little bit. Um, Justin, how often does that happen? The disaster mode switch? Oh, once every couple of years probably. At our hospital it happened, um, I think during the anthrax scare, it happened during 9-11. Um, Those cases where it was the, the large X, the Y disaster, where just tons of people coming in because they were scared? I wasn't there, um, but I will tell you that when I hear them talking about them, especially the anthrax, you're here. Um, now this can actually, 
if you, if you take this and you um, look at it over time as well, you can have several weeks that will sort of stay around here. Um, for example, um, Monday afternoon, you have a lot of people who um, have flu-like symptoms. None of them are very sick, but they all want to know, Doc, check me out. Tell me if I've got swine flu. So we sort of hover around here. Um, and so it's just sort of a kind of an abstract question. When do we pull the trigger? And ideally, we wouldn't pull a trigger. Ideally, our operations would be scalable uh, enough that we could just adapt to, um, you know, a time when, when, when you're up in the red zone. Um, I, I wanted to do this in, in 3D to show you that you can easily put another parameter or another axis, and that is the, the rate at which patients present. Um, a classic example would be you are, it's 8 o'clock in the morning, nothing's happening, and all of a sudden um, there's a bus accident full of uh, special needs adults, and um, they just have to get checked out. Nothing's wrong with any of them, and they drive them in, and all of a sudden the bus drops off, you know, 40 people. Um, you know, then you're up around here. So that's just another sort of parameter. But a very interesting question uh, and one that hopefully we can explore later as well in discussion, when do you, what do you call a disaster and why do you change your opera operations and what happens to workflow? Um, so let's talk about some of the types of information. It's hard to actually show a separate flow of information, um, but I want to talk about the types of information and, and where, they, where they're generated and the pattern in which they're generated. So demographics, just to sort of review, occurs in registration, and it's a one-time thing. Um, people's demographics don't change during the visit. The medical database uh, will refer to, um, consists of the chief complaint, the history of present illness, basically the story behind their chief complaint, their past medical history, the vital signs, and then the physical examination. So the chief complaint, as you can see, happens up front, sort of in lay terms. It's recorded. Uh, by a clerk up front. Um, it's often reiterated in, in triage and then really the doctor figures out, their job is to figure out really why are you here. You say you're, you say you're sick, you say you're here because um, you just don't feel well, but it turns out that you've got um, you know, the worst chest pain of your life and your wife just made you come in because you're a pretty stoic guy and that's re it, often this is not explicit, the chief complaint. And it's our job to make sure that we find it. Um, the history of present illness is expanded upon in the physician encounter. And it actually is kind of ongoing as well. Patients will add things. Hey, doc, I forgot to tell you this. So it's not a one-time thing. Past medical history is usually a one-time thing because it's available from the medical record. Um, vital signs are taken by the nurse and they're taken serially um, depending on how ill the patient is. The physical exam is ongoing. It's off, often uh, goes through a period of reevaluation. Um, if you are a uh, classic example of someone with abdominal pain, you're not too sure if they need a CAT scan, but they've got enough risk, risk factors that it could be something bad. So sort of give them some pain medicine, do some lab work, go back, fill their belly again before you're able to make a decision. Um, so, and when something like that happens, the documentation of that may not end up in the medical record until the patient leaves the department, until I, am, as a physician, am able to say, okay, this is what I want to put into the medical record to describe this patient's exam. Laboratory results come from the laboratory either after being put into the medical record or often if it's a critical result by phone. That's ongoing. Um, the same uh, as we discussed with uh, radiographic images and the dictations. Um, and then consultants um, come down and help us decide how to best take care of patients. Sometimes they'll come down and follow a patient through the course of um, the stay. It can be ongoing. Or sometimes they'll come and say, no, I don't think they have an appendicitis and they can go home. Um, and then also, this is really big is kind of the nonverbal and subjective um, things that are, can be inferred from uh, communication with other staff members, can be um, inferred from uh, talking to the, to the patient, um, and sometimes ways that other consultants or physicians 
will write a note in the med medical record. You can sort of read between the lines and the subtext may tell you something that's not explicitly stated. Um, and that's very important as far as um, medical decision making as well. So let's talk about principles of decision making. Um, the first is at its core, decision making is sort of hypothetical deductive and, and that is you present with some chief complaint, I will then initiate a battery of tests that will aid me in sort of proving my hypothesis wrong or, um, or, or proving myself right. Um, they can also be algorithmic and this really depends on how ill the patient is or how serious the the chief complaint is. If someone comes in uh, and says you know my belly just hurts and I've had a fever uh, there really isn't any strict algorithm for abdominal pain and fever. Um, if, if you are 65 and you twist your ankle and it hurts here, there is, however, a clear algorithm for how to take care of those patients. In reality, it's often a mix of this hypothetical deductive decision making and, and an algorithm. So this is sort of getting under the, the hood and into the brain of, of, of an emergency physician's mind. Um, so crossed with this algorithmic and hypothetical deductive um, sort of framework and approach, is time dependence. The emergency department is intensely time, and that's why I love it. What you do matters. Everything that you do matters. You have to anticipate the next step because we don't have all day to take care of patients. Um, we have other patients waiting. Um, some illnesses and some disease processes will reveal themselves, as I mentioned earlier, over you know, varying degree of time. And so we're doing number one, um, you know, on on an x-axis. And so things need to be um, things are very time dependent as well. And time is we're always trying to sort of get ahead of the curve of the natural progression of this disease process. Um, and I'll detail this in an, in, a, in an example here is the idea that. Diagnoses can either be presumptive or confirmed. Um, if it quacks like a duck, it often is a duck. Um, however, if we, have the, if we have the CAT scan that says it's a duck, well then it's a duck. And often we'll treat those two things um, like ducks. Um, as far as treatment is concerned, um, we treat things empirically or we use sort of more evidence-based um, approach. And sometimes they're not mutually exclusive. A good example is uh, a patient who comes in, has an x-ray that has a confirmed pneumonia, um, but we know based on the patient's age and other things that this is likely a community-acquired pneumonia, that there are five to seven different bacteria that could cause that pneumonia. We will initiate uh, empiric treatment of a particular antibiotic that we know will take care of all of those um, bacteria. And then, as I mentioned before, we're constantly reevaluating the patient, making sure that we're measuring the response to our therapies and uh, ordering any additional tests. Um, taken in the context of several patients, sometimes up to 25, we may need to reshuffle our priorities. Um, sick patients take precedence. It's very frustrating, but also understandable when you come out of a room and the patient who Two hours ago, you just said, I'm sorry, I know you don't feel well, I'll, I'll be right back, they're calling me. You run in and you spend the next uh, you know, hour, two hours um, running a code, resuscitating uh, a dying patient, and then you go back in and you say, I'm so sorry, where were we? Um, it's born out of necessity, it can be very frustrating, and it's hard sometimes to let other patients know that hey, I was in there with a dying patient for the last two hours, you know, give me a break, I'm sorry that that happened. Um, but that's certainly a part of the job. And then any intervention uh, or any interpretation needs to be taken in its appropriate context, both in terms of the individual or the group. 
Uh, a group sort of um, context would be in a disaster situation where you say, hey, I got to let the walking wounded kind of just turn them. And often the disasters, we will turn them around and send them home. Um, for the individual, uh, a patient who has a blood level of X, um, who also we know had a blood level of X for the last 10 years and has a reason for it, we don't really get too excited about l blood level X, although it's below normal. However, a healthy male or female who comes in who we assume had a blood level of Y that was normal two weeks ago and now has a blood level of X, we know that that's abnormal. So deciding how we interpret labs and imaging results is completely needs to be taken into context and, and that provides, um, um, it can be sometimes tough as well. I'm going to quickly go through two examples um, and then I think that's about it and we can, we can open it up. So to, to um, display some of these concepts. The first is uh, a 43 year old guy, uh, he calls the ambulance um, after twisting it while stepping off of a curb. By 722, he's in the department. He provides his demographic and insurance information. Um, after hearing his chief complaint and, you know, looking him over, they say, hey, you're level four, go to ambulatory care era. He's taken by, um, by a wheelchair. Um, the patient waits there for, you know, a little more than a half hour to be seen by a doctor. The doctor looks at him and says, Great, want to make sure you don't have a fracture, let's get an x-ray and here's a Percocet for your pain. Um, he, go, he gets the Percocet, he goes over to x-ray, um, the doctor reviews the x-ray and says, you don't have a broken ankle, asks the nurse to splint it. Uh, the nurse gives the patient some, um, a wrap, some crutches, and the patient's discharged. Easy peasy, right? So. Um, that was probably a very deterministic way of approaching that system. Um, depending on how many people were there, there was that converging node of, of radiology and maybe the nurse was busy with some other patients. Um, and not particularly chaotic and there was really no reevaluation. Um, that was a, as I mentioned, very algorithmic decision making process. Time was still of the essence and we had to anticipate to get the patient out in a timely manner so that we could see other patients. Um, we confirm that diagnosis by looking at an x-ray and we use some evidence-based practices that say ankles heal better if we wrap them. Um, and there was really, you know, a broken ankle is a broken ankle. Case two is a little more difficult and this is, this is kind of more what we live for. It's a 25 year old woman um, she didn't call the ambulance like the other guy. She walked into the emergency department. He's 25. She says, I've got a little chest pain. She provided her demographic information. Um, she was a three on the emergency severity index. Um, she had normal vital signs, kind of a reassuring story. Um, but, you know, chest pains don't usually go the fast track because more can go wrong in the chest. But in any case, she was assigned a three and she was sent over to the blue team. Before going to the blue team, she was seen by a triage doctor who said, well, you got chest pain, you look pretty well, but, you know, chances are that the doc on the blue team is going to want an x-ray, an EKG, and I'll order some blood tests that they probably will find pertinent. Um, the lab is drawn and, uh, by the nurse and sent to the lab. After seeing the triage doctor, the patient goes out into the waiting room for um, another two-plus hours. Um, and then waits. At 547, finally a room opens up on the blue team and the patient's taken back. Um, and the physician uh, starts the patient-physician encounter, takes a good history and performs a physical exam. Um, you know, after that, the, the patient notes that, you know, doc, I'm actually having a bit more pain. And the doc says, okay, well, we'll order some pain medicine. And the nurse gives it to her. Um, and then she's taken off to x-ray to get this, uh, to get the chest x-ray. So at six though, the patient returns from the x-ray. Uh, the nurse takes another set of vital signs and says, oh, it looks like the heart rate is a little elevated um, and it looks like her oxygen level had dropped a little bit. Um, the doctor is at the workstation and, and reviews the x-ray and says that it's normal. Um, but then also reviews the uh, 
reviews the lab work that was done that was actually sent by the triage doctor and says, well, I see here that you have an elevated D-dimer. Um, D-dimer is a blood test that checks for um, degradation products of blood clots. So it's not very specific. Uh, a lot of things can give you blood clots. But the utility of this test, and I won't belabor this, is that if it is normal, you essentially have excluded the possibility of any blood, any, uh, uh, blood clots. In this case, it was sent to rule out a blood clot in the, in the lungs. Um, he notes that it's high, though. Um, he or she notes that it's high, orders a CAT scan of the, of the chest um, to rule out a blood clot in the lung for this patient. That's at 6.07. Um, and then at 6.10, the nurse um, goes to the doctor and says, you know, these vital signs actually little, look a little worse. Um, so the doctor seeing that and then seeing that the uh, D-dimer is elevated says, well, let's presumptively treat this patient for a blood clot. So the doctor orders an injection of a blood thinner Lovenox um, just to prevent the clot from further forming, um, and then the nurse administers this. Well, at 621, the patient, not great vital signs, but still stable, goes over to the CAT scan, where the CAT scan of the chest is performed, and then comes back to the emergency department. When the patient comes back, and I hope your heart is just fluttering right now like mine is in anticipation of what's going to happen to this patient, um, the blood pressure actually is dangerously low when the patient comes back. Um, the doctor thinks uh, this is probably a worsening blood clot, gets the cardiologist to come and perform an ultrasound of the heart to, to, de to see if this blood pressure is caused by that. Um, at, at the bedside, the cardiologist performs this echocardiogram and notices that there's strain on the heart, presumptively from the blood clot. Um, and then the doctor then orders um, TPA, which is a clot-busting, sort of clot-chewing medication. This is administered by the nurse. Uh, the doctor then calls to request a bed up in the cardiac care unit, critical care unit. Yeah? So at this point, you're, you're waiting on the results of the CT scan. You're treating presumptively for an embolism that the CT scan can pretty much confirm or deny? The CT scan, as soon as it's performed, and is in the local database and then is in the electronic medical record and that takes a while to happen. How much pressure do you have to, for a case like this with the CT, you're, you're already treating presumably for something that yeah. is pretty critical for, how much pressure can you exert on the radiologist or on whatever other bottlenecks there are to get in the CT bag? Um, as much as the system will allow, um, the radiologists often are very overwhelmed, maybe you know, four gunshot wounds just came in and, you know, they're, they're booked up and they say, well, we got a bunch of trauma cases. Um, they, they have their own internal sort of triage system. It's not necessarily first come first serve. They also have a, a severity system roughly for other parts of the hospital. So like Imaging from some areas of the hospital take precedence. So CAT scan, you know, we, we have dedicated critical care radiologists who only read our scans and scans from the trauma unit. But in a smaller hospital, um, all the routine daily x-rays and CAT scans often are read by the same radiologist. Um, so often we need to make time-sensitive decisions without confirmed. Yeah, and that's, that's absolutely the point of that. And then as you can see, then at 707, after we've already administered this, uh, the TPA, the clot busting medication, the doc calls and says, or the radiologist calls and says, hey, I just want to let you know that your patient has a, uh, a blood clot. And we say, yeah, thanks. <laughs> we kind of, you know, we needed to act on the information that we had and the patient's now um, teed up for a CCU bed. Um, and then at 912, after more than two hours boarding and a length of stay of more than six hours, the patient is then transported up to um, the critical care unit. That is much more typical of kind of what we're dealing with and um, patient by patient, day to day. Uh, that, that does represent a very sick patient. I re remember what I said, about 3% of the patients that we see are admitted to a critical care unit. So, um, and then we talked about clearly this is deterministic and non-deterministic flow. Um, you know, the asynchronous and parallel flow. We talked about the feedback loops in terms of maybe administering pain medicine and going back and seeing what effect it has. Uh, and clearly there's 
chaos involved in that, especially if you sort of zoom out and you see nurses running and phone calls being made. But it all is embedded within a relative, you know, relatively, um, uh, I don't want to say easy, but defined system. Um, and then more or less most of these uh, decision-making concepts are, are utilized here. Um, so quickly we'll talk about current projects and then I just kind of want to open it up and we can um, chat. Uh, one thing that we're doing and this is um, I've been working with Greg and Desney and Dan. Yeah. Uh, just before we transition, mm -hmm. uh, you said that uh, the patient was randomly assigned to the blue mm -hmm. group. Do you literally mean randomly, or it just so happened that based on availability? That's I shouldn't have said randomly. Honestly, it's very low tech. How it happens is there is a rack for blue team, for red team, for green team. The triage nurse, after triaging the patient, takes the chart. There is a clip. Dan was there, saw it. Desi was there, saw it too. There is a clip on the rack. Whatever clip is on the rack, you put the chart in that rack. You move the clip to the next rack. So not randomly, it's just sort of sequentially. But it, the, the point is that there's no relation to acuity. Sure, I, I yeah. just randomly sounded like you were doing some kind of trial to figure out which team was the best and the patient might wait well, very long just so that you could do that. Embedded in, embedded in that flow chart, I have all of the colors going from all of the teams to all of the other ones. And that is because, come on, if, you know, if the green team doc is having a bad day and is very slow, and they're piling up, it makes sense to do a little reshuffling. And although we set up the system so that shouldn't happen, um, often that, that happens. The teams are not fixed to people. people the physicians are randomly assigned to teams yeah. also. So it's not really like it, you would evaluate one team at a time in that sense. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I, it just seemed a little odd for it to be random. Right? Yeah. I see whether um, any other quick questions just about the, the flow before we talk about um, quickly the projects that we're working on so far. Um, and there'll be plenty of time for questions afterwards as well. So one thing that we wanted to do was, uh, in working with Dan and Greg and Desney on this, is how do we effectively model throughput? You know, there are quite a few papers out there on neural networks. Um, there's some more kind of classic machine learning stuff, but people have been doing kind of neural networks, artificial neural networks of simplified in smaller emergency departments for quite a long time, for the last you know, 10, 15 years or so. Um, in, in this um, particular uh, project, we're using various machine learning techniques, none of which I'm at all qualified to talk about, although they sound pretty cool. Um, and the training data that we're using is from Microsoft, the Malga generated timestamps. Um, so most of what happens in the department requires a click by somebody that generates timestamps. They all reside on a SQL Server database, and we can utilize those and feed them through um, fancy SQL Server algorithms. Um, and so we're, we're able to predict with, and, and increasingly so all the time, with reasonable accuracy, a lot of different milestones um, in the visit. The one that we're utilizing most um, in trying to display is um, trying to predict uh, wait times based on these models and display the wait times in a way to patients waiting out in the waiting room. This is important because patients often wait, I mean you can wait six hours pretty easily on a busy Monday afternoon um, and the idea behind this is that we are, we're giving these kind of these receding flood bars to monitor progress. Um, the problem that we're finding and this I think is actually one of the more interesting problems is you know, on one side, the patient is given a ton, of, is given no information, kept in the dark. And the other side, if we give the patient too much information and our model is incorrect or is not accurate enough, we're setting up unachievable expectations um, for the providers where the patient will come up and say, hey, you said you were going to see me in two hours and 37 minutes, it's two hours and 38 minutes, what's going on? Um, so this is just a screenshot of what is a embedded in this is a dynamic model um, that will you know display these receding flood bars um, and there really is no time anchor for this and this is one of the things that we're trying to work on is how do we um, display this information so that it's it provides the appropriate amount of information yeah how often do you 
often do you see patients lie about their symptoms in order to get prioritized higher? Um, it is not uncommon that patients will, um, especially those who know the system, will manipulate the system um, for secondary gain, whether that's pain medication, whether that's to be seen more quickly. It's very common. And I, I assume, is it safe to assume that the more information you give them about wait time and such, the more likely they are to do that? Um, yes, to an extent. Often, our triage nurses are great and we can say, well, I understand that you say you're having the worst pain in your life, but we see here that your vital signs are totally normal and we know the people who exhibit, who are in true pain, um, usually have an elevated heart rate and there are kind of ways of, but it's, it's dangerous. A lot of patients know very key words they can say that will get them straight back. Um, but generally patients are, patients wait a long time um, and often don't, don't say anything. Yeah. Um, so uh, perhaps a slightly different direction of that is almost gaming the system any other way. So you've talked about like the Monday afternoon, you know, I'm feeling a little sniffly, I'm going to, you know, appear at the, at the ER or whatever. Um, the flip of that is so before we started, it sounded like a bunch of people this weekend probably, you know, put up holiday decorations and it's Thanksgiving weekend and, you know, I fell off my roof and whatever. Um, I'm wondering if, like we know that there are rush hours for for car traffic, and like we know that like even the DMV says, you know, don't show up to renew your driver's license on a Wednesday because we have higher than normal volume on a Wednesday. Yeah. Do you is there something interesting that can be abstracted? So like for example, I didn't know that there was a Monday after it didn't occur to me there was a Monday <laughs> afternoon phenomenon in the ER. When should I put my holiday lights up? I could, if I could do it Wednesday morning, <laughs> and like then I fall off my roof. No, I mean, better off. I might be like fall like, off my roof. So schedule. you know, well, in, unless you were, that's a great nearly, point. I mean, nearly that. Like, in as much as I can schedule the things that cause me to get damaged, can can yeah. people? Is there anything interesting there, or is yeah. that interesting? So essentially, you know, is messed up. you know, uh, using as a parallel the um, uh, traffic on a MAP program, is there any way to adjust your commute or seeking care? Um, yes, that could be done. The problem is, I think what makes that a little difficult is unless you are using the emergency department a lot, right, as, your primary care. as your primary care provider, um, or even if you're chronically ill but know, hey, I'm going to go to Atlantic City this month or this weekend and um, I'll probably eat a lot of salty food and come back and my congestive heart failure will be acting up. Um, you know, but I think that's very useful. Another thing is we do not want to dissuade for two reasons anybody to come to the emergency department. Number one, the more patients we see, the more people we can take care of, and the more money we can make, right? Um, number two is it gets very tricky when you're putting anything out there that would ever dissuade a person from seeking care. And that's one thing that we, a risk that we run with that and we'll monitor to that is I understand that you have chest pain, you've been made a triage level two, but the wait for a two, believe it or not, is still two hours because we're so busy. Assume that the other twos are either sicker twos or got there before you did but we, I, I understand that two hours is a long time, but at least you're in our sights and we can see you. We've got some vital signs. We would hate for anybody to come and say, oh, man, my weight's this. Well, I'm going to go somewhere else or I'm just going to come back tomorrow. Great. Great. Um, yeah, you might keep them in there. You can get, it's great to give them data when you've got them on the facility. Yeah. But, but if they're at home and they're like, yeah, wait, is three hours? I'm gonna just going to hang out here. Oh, my God, I'm dead. Absolutely. <laughs> and that's a huge fear. Um, My pulmonary embolism, your wait is four hours. Oh, I'll just hang out here at home. Yep. Yeah, sucks to be and, and it's much better for the natural course of that disease process to really manifest while you are in a waiting room or a monitored bed where things can still be done than to happen at home when you're by yourself. Um, out of my weird outlier, I fell off my roof because I was doing this, you know, largely self-inflicted thing. Yeah, almost no value to, exp to exposing that data outside the hospital. Well, uh, plenty of healthcare systems have displayed average wait times on billboards, 
like along the highway or on websites. And what they found is there's obviously sort of a redistribution. Um, but we don't want to redistri redistri redistribute patients. We want to see everybody and anybody that comes to our emergency department, but we want to do it quickly and safely so that we can make room for the next person who's coming in behind you. So you really you tell him to put up his Christmas tree ornaments before Thanksgiving so that uh, he'll beat the rush. And <laughs> yeah. I, I assume relative wait times would be relatively harmless to the patient, but potentially harmless to the bottom line. If you had a hospital system where the same hospital system with the same, uh, 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 where the, the money all went to the same place. The and the experiments that I line. mentioned are were in those settings. Yeah. Well, I think on the flip side of um, your idea of capturing the wait times and time of year and weather is how do you staff? You know you're going to have right. an Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's actually great. And then, you know, staff for those things. And, and if we collect the right data, since Amalga can take data from anything, data is data, then it would be very interesting to see is there actual causation or just correlation? You know, in, in assortment of data. And just so that you know, when I gave those ranges of staffing, we staff for averages. Um, and the only variations that we, we have a couple less docks during the, during the nighttime. And we ramp up during the day. But, uh, and sometimes some of the extra, like the triage team shifts we don't have on weekends, because weekends during the day actually tend to be pretty, pretty slow. Uh, but besides that, there really are... We kind of just staff for averages. Um, but the idea is that the system is scalable, that we can, you know, take, that we can work quickly in a surge um, situation. Unfortunately, that doesn't always happen because, um, you know, union laws govern some of these things, just plain old ethical laws govern some of these things. You cannot have a nurse, even though it just takes me, it may take me 15, 20 minutes to go see a patient, write a documentation, and then order some stuff. Well, a nurse has to do that, and he or she may have another critically ill patient that is boarding in the emergency department for two hours because the hospital is so full that there's not a room upstairs, um, and so you can't assign, although there's no law against assigning, you know, a physician to n number of patients, uh, the nurses and the nurse management, and I think rightfully so, once they start getting four or five patients, they're like, it's not safe. Just data too, and presumably some, you know, future or maybe current version of Amalga can consume that same type of information. And thou shalt have this number of, you know, minimum minimum level of nurse care. Yeah. Right. And I think that you can also add patient acuity to that. If you have a nurse with five patients and they're all at the worst acuity, that would be a lot harder to manage than five patients that have sprained ankles. Right. And so we could do some sort of algorithm, and then add in the staffing with historical on Christmas Eve, you know somebody's going to call in sick, and then so staff those sorts of staff fluctuations, you might stand a better sh chance of, of really evening things out. One thing, just one second, one thing that I hope that you'll find too, and the more we can work together is, um, and Dan and Desney especially have been subjected to this, um, you know, there is a certain culture in the emergency department. Um, there's a certain hierarchy um, within nurses, within physicians, within uh, the, the, the technologists, within the clerks, um, and between those as well. Um, and so certain cultural, professionally cultural attitudes um, often make some of these things difficult. As, as we all know, culture sort of lags behind in medicine often what, what makes sense. I mean, it's only until recently that um, residency programs, training programs, have put caps on work hours. Before that, you know, working 120, 140 hours, as much as you needed to in a week, was the norm, and the idea was, well, you know, tough. It's sort of a rite of passage. Um, so the first thing, I think, would be to prove that there are bad outcomes because staffing levels are low, and then that would give you the leverage to be able to um, use that data to to fix things, but it's incredibly interesting, and, and I, um, you know, I invite you all to, to come out and, and hang out, and you're all welcome any time to get an idea of, of how some of these cultural nuances shape um, implementation and 
and also evaluation of the data. Are, are there approximate simulators that have been built to try to figure out what happens, uh, you know, how long it takes with these pipelines of, you know, how long it takes to do a, a CT scan, how long it takes to do each thing where you, you could say, okay, if we threw, threw another CT scan machine in here, how would that change the workflow? Do, do you know if this has been done? It, I it don't. I, I'm sure that there have been. I, I've glanced over a couple um, papers that related to um, using neural networks to show if you perturb the system in this way, how will your outcomes um, um, for example, heart attacks or um, but in, as far as resource utilization, I've not. I mean, I think it would be a Or if you could add more staffing on them. There's a lot of literature, but they tend to be ED specific sometimes, so you would be able to tell how specific ED would react. ED, sorry, They apparently use it for something else in medicine now. Yeah, yeah, not that ED. I'm not here to talk about it. Yeah. So uh, I've looked at some of the simulation literature on uh, increasing throughput, and one of the problems with the literature is that the models that you build at the ED doesn't take into consideration the culture and the hierarchy that you talk about. Do you have any idea about how you could incorporate that, even for a specific ED? As, as far as, well, I mean, I think there are two ways. There is, you try to modify you essentially try to change culture, or at least modify what you can to streamline it. Um, as far as trying to codify that and, and having it be another parameter in your model um, to account for it, um, one thing that you may be able to do is if you were, right now a doctor is a doctor, right? A nurse is a nurse. You could look at um, differences in throughput or care given by different providers and then sort of, you know, weigh, well, Dr. X is a little slower, Dr. X is a little faster, this nursing team, even these nurses when together are more efficient and, and use that as sort of a proxy. Um, I would love to do that. I would tell you that you have to be very sensitive with that data. Um, no one wants to you end up putting people in competition. Yeah, so this is a small end, but I've looked at a, a hospital system in Atlanta and a uh, huge cultural difference between teaching hospital and non-teaching hospital. So if, if you were starting down that path, that might be one. Yep. Um, and it leads to, I mean, first of all, staffing differences and, mm -hmm. and then other cultural differences as well. So. Yep. Yeah. Um, and it, it, when you may be able to actually use that, though, if if it is a teaching hospital, it's a lot easier to evaluate residents and medical students and nursing trainees than it is to say to the 30-year emergency attending veteran, we're going to be watching you, you know? Do you think number of years in the field could be a determiner, or do you think that it's based once you're an attending? Because I think there's a clear line between residency and attending, that once you're an attending, that years of experience is... Some of our residents see more than some of our senior attendings. Some of our senior attendings are so fast, it's, it's you know, are faster than some of the young bucks. I mean, it's really, um, I think it's all over the map. And I think things would ultimately would kind of center towards the middle. Which then you beg the question, well, is that even, is that even a pertinent factor? Um, I wanted to just get your brief idea. I'll, I'll show this as well, something we're working on with um, Lauren Wilcox. She's out at Columbia uh, um, working on her PhD, and she was here as an intern, um, and we wanted to find out, she wanted to find out, um, is there any benefit to having an in-room display that may potentially be um, manipulated by the patient or that they, ha they have access to at the bedside that could show, you know, what's the care team information, uh, what are some of the results of my diagnostic tests, you know, things like, well, what's next, um, 
and, uh, and, and then also what patients and what the, f the physicians and providers deem would be relevant or appropriate information to put on one of those displays. And so um, we were able to complete a complex paper prototype, a big poster that was actually assembled by Desney and Lauren and Dan in real time using information from the physician and the electronic medical record. I'm sorry, I wish I could make that a little bigger, but um, we sort of just finished a, kind of a formative study and we've got a lot of other questions, um, but I think this was a great step, it was just received really well by hospital administration, very sort of high profile um, thing that was implemented relatively easily. I mean, you guys put a lot of work into it, but um, and has received, and most importantly, the patients absolutely love it and, and felt quite empowered by it. Um, so as far as potential projects, things that I've been thinking about and, and th that have been mentioned as well by other physicians is, um, is there, and Dan and I are, are and I read your, um, is there a way to sort of intelligently automate these patient displays? That is, do we, have physician define rules as to what is okay to display, taking into account that the interpretation of labs and images is contextual based on that individual person. And if that person has never been there before, been there once, you have relatively sort of a shallow pool of data to choose from to be able to, to make those decisions. Um, but I think that's a ton of fun to think about. And then also, you know, right now our documentation kind of impedes workflow. I mean, you're sitting there and, you know, if you're like me, you're writing madly in the room, but how much eye contact am I making with the patient? Well, you could also um, talk to the patient and then go outside and sit down and then type your note and stay after your shift or type your note and then nurses and other doctor coming up to you. I mean, it really, we just don't have a way to seamlessly sort of capture that encounter and is there a way sort of passively of doing it um, you know perhaps using voice recognition to sort of populate sort of predetermined templates that would kind of listen in and then and then populate um, sort of a, like an e-scribe right now there are some places that have scribes um, who are usually medical students or pre-med students who listen and then take notes and then the physician will um, will review those before they enter the medical record. Uh, but that, that would be incredibly useful. And the question would be, you know, how does that improve um, efficiency? And also, what impact does it have on the patient-physician relationship and ultimately patient satisfaction? Can I just ask you to expand on that idea just a minute? Mm -hmm. And when you were talking, I visualized you standing by the bedside with a voice-activated device, like a recorder. Well, the, based on your prompts, this would be yeah. And again, I don't know what technology exists. Um, this would not be just simply a dictation machine that's voice activated that will turn on. But um, you know, if you had if you had some device that had preloaded templates, um, so I understand you're here for chest pain. Opens up chest pain, um, and then so how long? You know, what duration of your chest pain? listens to duration and may populate that portion. Um, because when we document, we document for three reasons. To relay medical information between providers. We document for medical legal purposes um, to make sure that we're doing the right thing if we get sued. Um, and then also, we document for billing. Um, so a lot of the, the templates that exist uh, in these documentation systems that are already on the market they exist to capture sufficient information for um, documentation. And I think using prose text, um, someone in Medical Media Lab has already used some natural, PD was telling me, using natural language processing to sort of parse out, you know, relevant things for billing. But if we could do that using some sort of voice system, I think, you know, that may be a pipe dream, but it seems like... No, no, know. I think it's very doable. If you had a template that you could hit a tab on the keyboard and then it record your conversation mm -hmm. and then pull out through the natural language processing, pull out the relative information. Once it then comes to you, you do a little clean up sign it. Yeah. So that you've then captured all of the voice interactions between you and the patient, which we can leave as voice tags in the actual document. That, 
you know, that would be something ideal, but... Yeah. I don't think that's beyond... I wonder if there's even a... a the, the systems that are regularly used in particularly developing markets where, um, where the, the medical professional is someone who may or may not actually have specific medical training mm -hmm. and they're walked through a very formulaic kind of flowchart thing. You could imagine a similar kind of tool that you know the doc is working from and so that because they're walking through ostensibly a logical template, yeah. the system then knows I'm here, I'm there, and you can you know you tap on a little thing on the screen that says I've gone down this branch. Mm -hmm. And so then you have some t contextual awareness presumably about the kinds of data that the system will be expecting. Yeah. Would you describe your chest pain as mild or really not at all mild? Okay. And then that becomes data rather than merely a string that somebody needs to textize, right. as well as keeping your, you know, the voice stuff around. If somebody says, but this doesn't make any sense, but I didn't type back. Right. Have a recording of Justin's voice that says, what is the duration of your yeah. chest? Of Just your chest? hold out the, uh, <laughs> out the... Or like with the tablet that you have, you know, you could stand at the bedside and click that, record everything that's being said, click the next button, record it. Now there are T systems that exist. They're called T-systems that, that exist for documentation that allow you to sort of, electronic T-systems where you just sort of check boxes. Um, and that can be, but it still, it still requires um, uh, kind of deflecting your attention. Right. Um, and, and it also doesn't leave room for, there are, there's nuanced verbiages that, that verbiage that often needs to make its way into electronic meta record. So you need to have a, a space to be able to edit that um, afterwards. And, and I, by you know, no means, am, am an expert on all of those products that exist. Um, but we can keep talking about that. And then also using sort of fuzzy text classification schemes to be able to make better use of um, the text inputs that we already have now. So, for, for example, the um, chief complaint f field is often misspelled may have some loose association with what, what it really, what the chief complaint truly is. And that is a ton of data that right now we're just not able to use. Um, and if we were able to incorporate that into our model, um, clearly uh, chest pains look much more, look alike a, a kind of going down the pipe than does a chest pain and an abdominal pain, even though they both may be a two, may come in at the same time and be the same age. Um, so we think that there's probably some, some weight in that as well. Um, so those are things that we've brainstormed and hopefully will continue. I know we're at 12 now and I want to be cognizant of time, but is there anything that anybody, I hope this was you know, somewhat useful to kind of give an idea um, as to kind of what goes to our our brains. Great. Very useful, thank you. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, guys.